13. It was July again. Dusander, carefully dressed in one of his three suits, not his best, was standing at the bus stop and waiting for the last local of the day to take him home. It was 10.45 p.m. He had been to a film, a light and frothy comedy that he had enjoyed a great deal. He had been in a fine mood ever since the morning mail. There had been a postcard from the boy, a glossy color photo of Waikiki Beach with bone-white high-rise hotels standing in the background. There was a brief message on the reverse. Dear Mr. Denker, boy, this sure is some place. I've been swimming every day. My dad caught a big fish, and my mom is catching up on her reading joke. Tomorrow we're going to a volcano. I'll try not to fall in. Hope you're okay. Stay healthy, Todd. He was still smiling faintly at the significance of that last, when a hand touched his elbow. Mister? Yes? He turned on his guard. Even in Santo Donato, muggers were not unknown, and then winced at the aroma. It seemed to be a combination of beer, halitosis, dried sweat, and possibly muster oil. It was a bum in baggy pants. He, it, wore a flannel shirt and very old loafers that were currently being held together with dirty bands of adhesive tape. The face looming above this motley costume looked like the death of God. You got an extra dime, mister? Gotta get to L.A., me. Got a job opportunity. I need just to dine more for the express bus. Wouldn't ask if it wasn't a big chance for me. Dusander had begun to frown, but now his smile reasserted itself. Is it really a bus ride you wish? The wino smiled sickly, not understanding. Suppose you ride the bus home with me, Dusander proposed. I can offer you a drink, a meal, a bath, and a bed. All I ask in return is a little conversation. I am an old man. I live alone. Company is sometimes very welcome. The drunk smile abruptly grew more healthy as the situation clarified itself. Here was a well-to-do old faggot with a taste for slumming. All by yourself. Bitch, innit? it? Dusander answered the broad, insinuating grin with a polite smile. I only ask that you sit away from me on the bus. You smell rather strongly. Maybe you don't want me stinking up your place, then, the drunk said with sudden tipsy dignity. Come, the bus will be here in a minute. Get off one stop after I do, and then walk back two blocks. I'll wait for you on the corner. In the morning I will see what I can spare. Perhaps two dollars. Maybe even five, the drunk said brightly. His dignity, tipsy or otherwise, had been forgotten. Perhaps, perhaps, Dusanta said impatiently. He could now hear the low diesel drone of the approaching bus. He pressed a quarter of the correct bus fare into the bum's grimy hand and strolled a few paces away without looking back. The bum stood undecided as the headlights of the local swept over the rise. He was still standing and frowning down at the quarter when the old faggot got on the bus without looking back. The bum began to walk away, and then, at the last second, he reversed direction and boarded the bus just before the doors folded closed. He put the quarter into the fare box with the expression of a man putting a hundred dollars down on a long shot. He passed Dusander without doing more than glancing at him and sat at the back of the bus. He dozed off a little, and when he woke up, the rich old faggot was gone. He got off at the next stop, not knowing if it was the right one or not, and not really caring. He walked back two blocks and saw a dim shape under the streetlight. It was the old faggot, all right. The faggot was watching him approach, and he was standing as if at attention. For just a moment, the bum felt a chill of apprehension, an urge to just turn away and forget the whole thing. Then the old man was gripping him by the arm, and his grip was surprisingly firm. Good, the old man said. I'm very glad you came. My house is down here. It's not far. Maybe even ten, the bum said, allowing himself to be led. Maybe even ten, the old faggot agreed, and then laughed. Who knows? Fourteen. The bicentennial year arrived. 
Todd came by to see Dusander half a dozen times between his return from Hawaii in the summer of 1975 and the trip he and his parents took to Rome, just as all the drum-thumping, flag-waving, and tall ships-watching was approaching its climax. These visits to Dusander were low-key and in no way unpleasant. The two of them found they could pass the time civilly enough. They spoke more in silences than they did in words, and their actual conversations would have put an FBI agent to sleep. Todd told the old man that he had been seeing a girl named Angela Farrow off and on. He wasn't nuts about her, but she was the daughter of one of his mother's friends. The old man told Todd he had taken up braiding rugs because he had read such an activity was good for arthritis. He showed Todd several samples of his work, and Todd dutifully admired them. The boy had grown quite a bit, had he not? Well, two inches. Had Dusander given up smoking? No, but he had been forced to cut down. They made him cough too much now. How had his schoolwork been? Challenging, but exciting. He had made all A's and B's, had gone to the state finals with his science fair project on solar power, and was now thinking of majoring in anthropology instead of history when he got to college. Who was mowing Dusander's lawn this year? Randy Chambers from just down the street, a good boy but rather fat and slow. During that year, Dusander had put an end to three winos in his kitchen. He had been approached at a downtown bus stop some twenty times, had made the drink, dinner, bath, and bed offer seven times. He had been turned down twice, and on two other occasions the winos had simply walked off with the quarters Dusander gave them for the fare box. After some thought, he had worked out a way around this. He simply bought a book of coupons. They were $2.50, good for 15 rides, and non-negotiable at the local liquor stores. On very warm days just lately, Dusanda had noticed an unpleasant smell drifting up from his cellar. He kept his doors and windows firmly shut on these days. Todd Bowden had found a wino sleeping it off in an abandoned drainage culvert behind a vacant lot on Cienega Way. This had been in December, during the Christmas vacation. He had stood there for some time, hands stuffed into his pockets, looking at the wino and trembling. He had returned to the lot six times over a period of five weeks, always wearing his light jacket, zipped halfway up to conceal the craftsman hammer tucked into his belt. At last he had come upon the wino again, that one or some other, and who really gave a fuck, on the first day of March. He had begun with the hammer end of the tool, and then at some point he didn't really remember when everything had been swimming in a red haze, he had switched to the claw end obliterating the wino's face. For Kurt Dusander, the winos were a half-cynical propitiation of gods he had finally recognized, or re-recognized. And the winos were fun. They made him feel alive. He was beginning to feel that the years he had spent in Santa Donato, the years before the boy had turned up on his doorstep with his big blue eyes and his wide American grin, had been years spent being old before his time. He had been just past his mid-sixties when he came here, and he felt much younger than that now. The idea of propitiating gods would have startled Todd at first, but it might have gained eventual acceptance. After stabbing the wino under the train platform, he had expected his nightmares to intensify, to perhaps even drive him crazy. He had expected waves of paralyzing guilt that might well end with a blurted confession or the taking of his own life. Instead of any of those things, he had gone to Hawaii with his parents and enjoyed the best vacation of his life. He had begun high school last September, feeling oddly new and refreshed, as if a different person had jumped into his Todd Bowden skin. Things that had made no particular impression on him since earliest childhood, the sunlight just after dawn, the look of the ocean off the fish pier, the sight of people hurrying on a downtown street at just that moment of dusk when the streetlights come on, these things now imprinted themselves on his mind again, in a series of bright cameos, in images so clear they seemed electroplated. He tasted life on his tongue like a draft of wine straight from the bottle. After he had seen the stew bum in the culvert, but before he killed him, the nightmares had begun again. The most common one involved the wino he had stabbed to death in the abandoned train yard. Home from school, he burst into the house, a cheery, high Monica baby on his lips. It died there, 
as he saw the dead wino in the raised breakfast nook. He was sitting slumped over their butcher block table in his puke-smelling shirt and pants. Blood had streaked across the bright tiled floor. It was drying on the stainless steel counters. There were bloody handprints on the natural pine cupboards. Clipped to the noteboard by the fridge was a message from his mother. Todd, gone to the store, back by 3.30. The hands of the stylish sunburst clock over the Gen Air range stood at 3.20, and the drunk was sprawled dead up there in the nook like some horrid, oozing relic from the subcellar of a junk shop, and there was blood everywhere, and Todd began trying to clean it up, wiping every exposed surface, all the time screaming at the dead wino that he had to go, had to leave him alone, and the wino just lolled there and stayed dead, grinning up at the ceiling, and freshets of blood kept pouring from the stab wounds in his dirty skin. Todd grabbed the O-Cedar mop from the closet and began to slide it madly back and forth across the floor, aware that he was not really getting the blood up, only diluting it, spreading it around, but unable to stop. And just as he heard his mother's town and country wagon turn into the driveway, he realized the wino was Dusander. He woke from these dreams, sweating and gasping, clutching double handfuls of the bedclothes. But after he finally found the wino in the culvert again, that wino or some other, and used the hammer on him, these dreams went away. He supposed he might have to kill again, and maybe more than once. It was too bad, but of course their time of usefulness as human creatures was over, except their usefulness to Todd, of course. And Todd, like everyone else he knew, was only tailoring his lifestyle to fit his own particular needs as he grew older. Really, he was no different than anybody. You had to make your own way in the world. If you were going to get along, you had to do it by yourself. Fifteen. In the fall of his junior year, Todd played varsity tailback for the Santa Donato Cougars and was named All-Conference. And in the second quarter of that year, the quarter which ended in late January of 1977, he won the American Legion Patriotic Essay Contest. This contest was open to all city high school students who were taking American history courses. Todd's piece was called An American's Responsibility. During the baseball season that year, he was the school's star pitcher, winning four and losing none. His batting average was 361. At the awards assembly in June, he was named Athlete of the Year and given a plaque by Coach Haynes. Coach Haynes, who had once taken him aside and told him to keep practicing his curve because none of these niggers can hit a curveball, Bowden, not one of them. Monica Bowden burst into tears when Todd called her from school and told her he was going to get the award. Dick Bowden strutted around his office for two weeks following the ceremony, trying not to boast. That summer they rented a cabin in Big Sur and stayed there for two weeks, and Todd snorkeled his brains out. During that same year, Todd killed four derelicts. He stabbed two of them and bludgeoned two of them. He had taken to wearing two pairs of pants on what he now acknowledged to be hunting expeditions. Sometimes he rode the city buses looking for likely spots. The best two he found were the Santo Donato Mission for the Indigent on Douglas Street and around the corner from the Salvation Army on Euclid. He would walk slowly through both of these neighborhoods waiting to be panhandled. When a wino approached him, Todd would tell him that he, Todd, wanted a bottle of whiskey, and if the wino would buy it, Todd would share the bottle. He knew a place, he said, where they could go. It was a different place every time, of course. He resisted a strong urge to go back either to the train yard or to the culvert behind the vacant lot on Cienega Way. Revisiting the scene of a previous crime would have been unwise. During the same year, Dusander smoked sparingly, drank ancient age bourbon, and watched TV. Todd came by once in a while, but their conversations became increasingly arid. They were growing apart. Dusander celebrated his 79th birthday that year, which was also the year Todd turned 16. Dusander remarked that 16 was the best year of a young man's life. 41, the best year of a middle-aged man's, and 79, the best of an old man's. Todd nodded politely. Dusanda had been quite drunk and cackled in a way that made Todd distinctly uneasy. Dusander had dispatched two winos during Todd's academic year of 1976 and 77. The second had been livelier than he looked. Even after Dusander had gotten the man suddenly drunk, he had tottered around the kitchen with the haft of a steak knife jutting from the base of his neck, gushing blood down the front of his shirt and onto the floor. 
The wino had rediscovered the front hall after two staggering circuits of the kitchen and had almost escaped the house. Dusander had stood in the kitchen, eyes wide with shocked unbelief, watching the wino grunt and puff his way toward the door, rebounding from one side of the hall to the other and knocking cheap courier knives' reproductions to the floor. His paralysis had not broken until the wino was actually groping for the doorknob. Then Dusander had bolted across the room, jerked open the utility drawer, and pulled out his meat fork. He ran down the hall with the meat fork held out in front of him and drove it into the wino's back. Dusander had stood over him, panting, his old heart racing in a frightening way, racing like that of a heart attack victim on that Saturday night TV program he enjoyed, Emergency. But at last it had slowed back into a normal rhythm, and he knew he was going to be all right. There had been a great deal of blood to clean up. That had been four months ago, and since then he had not made his offer at the downtown bus stop. He was frightened of the way he had almost bungled the last one, but when he remembered the way he had handled things at the last moment, pride rose in his heart. In the end, the wino had never made it out the door, and that was the important thing. 16. In the fall of 1977, during the first quarter of his senior year, Todd joined the rifle club. By June of 1978, he had qualified as a marksman. He made all-conference in football again, won five and lost one during the baseball season, the loss coming as the result of two errors and one unearned run, and made the third-highest merit scholarship score in the school's history. He applied to Berkeley and was promptly accepted. By April, he knew he would either be valedictorian or salutatorian on graduation night. He very badly wanted to be valedictorian. During the latter half of his senior year, an odd impulse came on him, one which was as frightening to Todd as it was irrational. He seemed to be clearly and firmly in control of it, and that, at least, was comforting, but that such a thought should have occurred at all was scary. He had made an arrangement with life. He had worked things out. His life was much like his mother's bright and sunshiny kitchen, where all the surfaces were dressed in chrome, formica, or stainless steel a place where everything worked when you pressed the buttons. There were deep and dark cupboards in this kitchen, of course, but many things could be stored in them, and their doors still be closed. This new impulse reminded him of the dream in which he had come home to discover the dead and bleeding wino in his mother's clean, well-lighted place. It was as if, in the bright and careful arrangement he had made, in that place-for-everything-and-everything-in-its-place kitchen of his mind, A dark and bloody intruder now lurched and shambled, looking for a place to die conspicuously. A quarter of a mile from the Bowden house was the freeway, running eight lanes wide. A steep and brushy bank led down to it. There was plenty of good cover on the bank. His father had given him a Winchester 3030 for Christmas, and it had a removable telescopic sight. During rush hour, when all eight lanes were jammed, He could pick a spot on that bank and, why, he could easily do what? Commit suicide? Destroy everything he had worked for these last four years? Say what? No, sir, no, ma'am, no way. It is, as they say, to laugh. Sure it was. But the impulse remained. One Saturday, a few weeks before his high school graduation, Todd cased the thirty thirty after carefully emptying the magazine. He put the rifle in the back seat of his father's new toy, a used Porsche. He drove to the spot where the brushy slope dropped steeply down to the freeway. His mother and father had taken the station wagon and had driven to L.A. for the weekend. Dick, now a full partner, would be holding discussions with the Hyatt people about a new Reno hotel. Todd's heart bumped in his chest and his mouth was full of sour electric spit as he worked his way down the grade with the cased rifle in his arms. He came to a fallen tree and sat cross-legged behind it. He uncased the rifle and laid it on the dead tree's smooth trunk. A branch jutting off at an angle made a nice rest for the barrel. He snugged the butt plate into the hollow of his right shoulder and peered into the telescopic sight. Stupid! His mind screamed at him. Boy, this is really stupid. If someone sees you, it's not going to matter if the gun's loaded or not. You'll get in plenty of trouble, maybe even end up with some chippy shooting at you. It was mid-morning, 
and the Saturday traffic was light. He settled the crosshairs on a woman behind the wheel of a blue Toyota. The woman's window was half open, and the round collar of her sleeveless blouse was fluttering. Todd centered the crosshairs on her temple and dry-fired. It was bad for the firing pin, but what the fuck? Pow, he whispered, as the Toyota disappeared beneath the underpass half a mile up from the slope where Todd sat. He swallowed around a lump that tasted like a stuck-together mass of pennies. Here came a man behind the wheel of a Subaru Brat pickup truck. This man had a scuzzy-looking gray beard and was wearing a San Diego Padres baseball hat. You're a... you're a dirty rat. The dirty rat that shot my brother, Todd whispered, giggling a little, and dry-fired the thirty-thirty again. He shot at five others, the impotent snap of the hammer spoiling the illusion at the end of each kill. Then he cased the rifle again. He carried it back up the slope, bending low to keep from being seen. He put it into the back of the Porsche. There was a dry, hot pounding in his temples. He drove home, went up to his room, masturbated.